USIS, normally we, um, we follow what the U.S. government does. Uh, we follow OPM. And we got the message this morning that the federal government was closed, uh, at which point we thought this event was not going to happen. Then I guess it was 15 minutes later, we received an email from our present CEO, John Hamry, said, we're opening today. So, um, so uh, uh, this event um, is probably one of the only ones that is going on today in Washington this morning. And it just goes to show you that, you know, Korea, Korea watchers are really diehard diehard people. So, um, um, uh, it's a very special event. This is something that we wanted to do for quite some time to bring together um, some of the former commanders in Korea uh, to help us think about the security situation uh, in the region, uh, Korea uh, and the region more broadly. And um, um, in, in planning for an event like this, we were uh, looking for, in addition to our commanders, uh, someone from the, both the policy world with a strong academic background who could talk about uh, uh, both policy issues and strategy and planning issues, and there was no better person uh, than Dr. Hicks. So um, we'll begin today by, uh, I will start by introducing, formally introducing our, um, our participants, uh, and they will have a discussion, and then we will open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, I apologize both to our audience and to our panelists for the, uh, um, uh, not that you are all chopped liver, but for the meager showing today. I think many people are watching this live cast uh, on the CSIS website to, uh, to um, avoid the, the difficult weather. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, let me start with uh, General uh, John Talelli. Uh, General Talelli served as Commander in Chief of the United Nations Command, Republic of Korea, U.S. CFC and USFK from July 1996 to December 1999. Uh, his command positions include Commander, 7th Army Training Command and Combat Maneuver Training Center, Commander, 1st Cavalry Division, Fort Hood, Texas, during Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Vice Chief of the Staff of the Army and Commander, United States <coughs> Army Forces Command. He ser served two tours in Vietnam and four tours in Virginia. His staff assignments included three tours at the Pentagon, Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Research Development and Acquisition, Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans in the Office of the Chief of Staff for the Army, and Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Plans, Department of the Army. After his retirement, he was appointed as President and CEO of USO, USO Worldwide Operations. He currently is Chairman and CEO of Cypress International. Uh, he graduated from Pennsylvania Military College, now Widener College University, where he received a degree in economics and was commissioned as an armor officer. He holds a master's degree in administration from Lehigh and graduated from the U.S. Army War College. Uh, General Skip Sharp served as Commander-in-Chief of UNC, um, CFC, and USFK from June 3, 2008 to July 14, 2011. His command positions included Division Commander, 3rd Infantry Division, Fort Stewart, Georgia, Assistant Division Commander for Maneuver, 2nd Infantry Division, Camp Red Cloud, South Korea, Regimental Commander, 2nd Army, Armored Cavalry Regiment, Fort Polk, Louisiana, Squadron Commander, 1st Squadron, 7th U.S. Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division, Fort Hood, Texas, and Army Company Commander, 1st Battalion, 67th Armor, and 2nd Armored Division, Fort Hood, Texas. He commanded troops in Desert Shield and Desert Storm, Operation Uphold Democracy in Haiti, and the Stabili Stabilization Force Multinational Division in Bosnia. He is now consulting for several U.S. and Korean firms. He's on the board of the directors of the Korea Society and involved in strategy and policy discussions at several D.C. think tanks, including CSIS. General Sharp graduated from West Point in 1974 and was commissioned as an armor officer. He earned a master's of science degree in operations research and system analysis from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Uh, General James D. Thurman, J.D. Thurman, served as commander-in-chief UNC, CFC, and USFK from July 14, 2011 to October 2, 2013. General Thurman's command positions included uh, 5th Corps, Germany, 4th Infantry Division, Fort Hood, Texas, and Baghdad, Iraq, Commanding General National Training Center Operations Group National Training Center, 2nd Brigade, 3rd Infantry Division, Fort Stewart, Georgia, 
3rd Squadron, 4th Cavalry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division, 2nd Squadron, 2nd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. He has extensive Army and Joint Staff experience, including Deputy Chief of Staff, Headquarters Department of the Army, Director of Army Aviation Task Force Office as a Deputy Chief of Staff, Chief Operations Coalition Forces Land Component Command in Kuwait, Director of Training Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff, Department of the Army. He also served as Chief of the Plans and Policy Division for Allied Forces Southern Europe and Kosovo, and his Battalion Executive Officer in the 1st Cavalry Division during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. General Thurman earned his commission through ROTC at East Central Oklahoma University. He is a graduate of Command and General Staff College and the Army War College and holds a BA in History from East Central Oklahoma University and an MA in Management from Webster University. Uh, Dr. Kathleen Hicks is our Senior Vice President, Henry Kissinger Chair and Director of the International Security Program at CSIS. She previously served as Principal Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and Deputy, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy Plans and Forces. As Principal Deputy Undersecretary for Policy, Dr. Hicks was responsible for advising the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy and the Secretary of Defense on issues pertaining to the development and execution of U.S. national defense policy and strategy. As Deputy Undersecretary for Strategy Plans and Forces, she led the development of the 2012 Defense Strategic Guidance and the 2010 Quadrennial Defense Review and oversaw the strategic guidance, development, review, and plans for the day-to-day -day military activities of the combatant commanders. Prior to her service um, at the Defense Department, she was a senior fellow at CSIS where she co-directed the CSIS Task Force on Non-Traditional Security Assistance, led strategy planning and process assessments on the Project for National Security Reform, and, and assess the national security community's role in improving global health. Dr. Hicks holds a PhD in political science from MIT, an MA from uh, University of Maryland School of Public Affairs, and a BA magna cum laude from Mount Holyoke College. Um, as you know, Sid Seiler will be joining us for lunch, so I'll introduce him then. Uh, I think um, part of the purpose of uh, the long and extended introductions was not because I like to hear myself talk, but um, I just wanted you to all really have a sense of the wealth of experience that we have on the stage today. So on behalf of CSIS, Dr. Hicks and I, we're very happy to host these three generals, and I will turn it over to you now. Great. Thank you very much, Victor. And I'm reminded that the last time I had an event this season that we had a snow day, it was hosting the Canadian Chief of Defense Forces. And I have a similar feeling today with snow barely falling. And here we're, we're going to uh, have hardy uh, uh, generals who've survived Korean winters. Um, so I appreciate you uh, showing just how, uh, how wimpy we here in Washington are that uh, this snow puts us off. Um, gentlemen, let me begin very, very broadly. I'm going to ask each of you, beginning with General Talali, um, of a pretty open-ended question. Um, the U.S. and the Republic of Korea have recently signed, as you know, a new a renewal, essentially, of the Special Measures Agreement provides extensive support to U.S. Forces Korea um, and reinforce the presidential statement made last May. And I'm interested, based on your own history and experiences, each of you at a different time in the U.S.-ROC relationship, how you think about and would characterize the state of the security relationship between the U.S. and the Republic of Korea right now. And maybe to help refine that a little, if you can think of anything in particular that gives you the greatest degree of hope um, for that alliance and what causes you the greatest concern to the alliance. Um, I'd be interested in, in hearing that broad overview from you. General Talelli, if we could start with you. Well, thanks for allowing me to be here and inviting me. Uh, I've always said, and I still believe to this date, uh, that the ROC and the U.S. alliance is a model alliance it's the model of any alliance that the U.S. would engage in. It's a very strong alliance. It's an alliance that's been born in blood and, and carried through uh, multiple uh, activities. Uh, in, in a real sense, uh, when you think of uh, the ROC and the U.S. alliance, uh, I think uh, one of the terms that all of us have used when we're in the Republic of Korea, we, we say, kachi, kachi, da, we go together. 
And truly, that's the sense and spirit of the Iraq-U.S. alliance over, over many years. You look for a positive indication. I think the positive indication is the close working relationship uh, between uh, the leadership of not only the Iraq Armed Forces, but also the Iraq administrations over time. I think uh, second, secondarily, and in my view, my personal view, uh, when you think of uh, the friendships that have been bred over 60 years of working together, it's not only an alliance of people and countries and military, it's an alliance of friends and families that have been born over relationships bred over time. You look at one positive activity, and I think a positive activity that we need to think about is in each and every time the United States has been engaged overseas, where we have asked the, the Republic of Korea government to assist the United States. You can look at Vietnam, you can look at Iraq, you can look at Afghanistan, you can look at many places that we've been. The Iraq has, have always contributed forces. So how positive is that when you think about it in the context of our other alliances that we've had? When you think, in my mind's eye, what's the biggest threat uh, to, to our alliance? Uh, it, it, I think the biggest threat to the alliance, of course, uh, is not a function of differences of opinion because each, each uh, nation has its own vital interests, but I think it's, it's how you work those interests over time. For example, uh, the United States uh, Defense Department is in a time of budgetary constraints. So what does that mean towards the alliance? That's not a large threat because the alliance is strong, but it is a threat to how we execute things. So that's my view. I think it's a strong model alliance, best alliance in the world. I've always thought that, uh, and after serving there for, for, for close to four years and being very close to the uh, Iraq uh, forces and administration, I still believe that. General uh, I think General Tully said it very well. Um, I believe that the Republic of Korea U.S. alliance is the strongest alliance anywhere in the world that the United States has, uh, bar none. Uh, and it's not just from a military perspective, it's from a diplomatic, an economic perspective, a social perspective. We work together very closely to be able to try to maintain peace and stability and security around the world and to promote the values of democracy, freedom, and human rights around the world. And as General Tully says, we've historically been doing that for, for 60 years now as we go, as we go through. Uh, I think that that strength, that understanding, that having the same basic core values between our two countries enables us to work through some of the difficult issues that face us now and will face us in the future, continue to face us in, in, the, in the future. Of course, the biggest one is to be able to how to maintain stability with Kim Jong-un in North Korea and in, uh, in what he's been doing and his father before him. But I am very confident that this alliance will be able to continue to work together to be able to maintain that strength that's needed uh, for anything that comes in the future. Okay. Uh, thanks. And uh, first off, it's an honor for me to be here uh, this morning with uh, uh, two great general officers and Dr. Hitch and Dr. J. Uh, I would tell you the alliance is very strong. And I'm probably three months removed. I had never served in Korea, but it was the best military partnership I was ever part of. And uh, we were talking about contributions to us in Iraq. I had the opportunity to serve with the previous two times removed ROC chairman, who ended up being my deputy and, and the ROC chairman, General Jung. He and I were in Iraq at the same time. And the strength of that alliance over there right now, I believe, is built not only from the blood and sacrifice of the Korean War, but on the mutual trust that you see every day, particularly inside of Combined Forces Command, which I believe is one of the key linchpins of the alliance uh, with how Combined Forces Command works. And I spent the majority of my time with the three hats I had with Combined Forces Command. 
but I would agree with both the uh, uh, general officers here about uh, their perspectives. Uh, I think the budgetary constraints that we see out there today uh, can cause some issues uh, for the future. But I think the alliance does two things. It provides strong deterrence, and it also provides assurance, not only to the region, but to the ROC public. And I think that's very important. Uh, it's what I saw over the course of the last few months. Very Thank good. you. Let's talk a little bit um, first about the North Korean threat. Um, you know, for for everybody, I think, but JD, you you've dealt with um, a prior leader. Um, you now have Kim Jong Un in place. We've had, um, if you will, the cycle of provocation that we are used to, uh, repeated under him, um, to include the nuclear tests last year. Let me start, if I may, with JD. How do you how do you um, talk to people in Washington when you? Uh, came back here about, or people out across the country, about the North Korean threat, and what is it Americans most need to understand that maybe they don't about that threat? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, right after I took over, uh, of course, Kim Jong-il was, was in charge, and we talked a lot about what's going to happen when this guy dies. And so just by a coincidence, we did a rehearsal inside of Combined Forces Command on what are we going to do when Kim Jong-il dies. Well, it turns out that he dies on 15 December of, of 2011, and we find out on the 17th that he's dead, and then Kim Jong-un is going to be the successor. I was a bit hopeful that things may change. Again, I had not been there in, in Korea, so I had an open mind about what I was seeing. One, he had been educated in the Western world, so I was a bit hopeful. But what I watched happen over time, uh, during my time, is uh, we roll in with uh, kind of the quiet period, the, the mourning period after the death of the leader and the new leader is starting to get on board. And we have the 29 February 2012 leap year deal that's made, you know, where we're not going to do any nuclear testing in exchange for subsistence, nutritional subsistence. And then that fails. And uh, as a result of North Koreans saying they're going to do a peaceful satellite launch. So I started seeing things change. And so I was becoming convinced that things were not probably going to uh, be as good as what I was optimistic about. And so the period that I uh, served over there was uh, one failed missile launch, a successful missile launch where they put a satellite in orbit. Uh, the KN-08 appears, the missile portfolio, the... Uh, the use of asymmetric type threats. I had uh, followed uh, General Sharp, as you know. Uh, we had had the sinking of the Chonin, which had occurred in March, where we lost 46 rock sailors. And then we had the, uh, the shelling of the uh, Yangpongdo Island, and uh, where there was another loss of life. So I was watching all this, and then we have the nuclear test, largest yield to date that we know of. And so one, uh, what I tried to do is not overstate the problem to Washington, D.C., but to give my honest assessment as the commander of what I was seeing from an asymmetric point of view. I think that is probably our greatest threats over there today. I was not that much worried about North Korean ground forces. Yes, they have large force, but I do think their ground capability is atrophying. But the missile portfolio that they continue to develop, and with the long-range missile, uh, 
They put a satellite in orbit, which could be, at some point, become an ICBM. I think that's a real threat. Road mobile capability is hard to find on the battlefield. And that's something, particularly in that terrain, that we got to pay attention to. So my emphasis during that period of time, as I talked to Washington, was on what I was seeing from an asymmetric uh, 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 portfolio. The WMD portfolio, not only uh, missiles and the nuclear piece is disturbing, but also chemical. They have large chemical stockpiles up there. They also have cyber capability. So that's what I think we have to worry about for the future. And I think when you're talking to Washington, D.C., it's important not to overstate the problem. And that's what I tried to do is, because we dealt with many challenges, and it's easy to get things very excited here and do the wrong thing. But I went back to two things. One, I had to maintain armistice, and I had to prevent war and preserve options. That's how I looked at my job every day. So, thank you. Um, I think my message to Washington and the people of the United States uh, would be twofold. Number one, Kim Jong-un only cares about one thing, and that's regime survival. Period. End of statement. He will do anything necessary, both internally and externally, to maintain the regime, and I think he has proven that over the last, since he's been in power and his father before, beforehand. Secondly, as people talk about the status quo, the recurring cycles of provocation, and my message has always been, you have to think about that not as status quo, meaning a straight, even line, but as a line that is becoming increasingly more dangerous because of the increased capability that North Korea is, is gaining with that time to build the nuclear capability and a ballistic missile capability. So I believe that we in Washington, and I'm confident the Republic of Korea also needs to think about the threat of Korea, North Korea along those two different axes and be prepared to defend South Korea, be prepared for instability within North Korea. And uh, I, I do not believe that Kim Jong-un and the regime will change and open up, uh, period. John Twelly, you have the longest perspective on the on North Korea. What, what are your views in terms of the threat of this? Well, the first thing I will say when dealing with North Korea, hope is not a method. The fact of the matter is, is we've uh, counted on hope for many, many years that North Korea will change, and they have not. Uh, you can look at the various uh, sign curves, if you will, on what we've tried to do to persuade them to uh, cease and uh, denuclearize, if I can use that term, and at the same time stop their uh, missile programs. Uh, General Sharp's exactly right. Uh, when you look at the regime, job one is to keep the regime in power, and that's the very danger of the, the entire situation there. The asymmetric piece of nuclear missiles, cyber, other weapons of mass destruction, special operational forces, pose a very serious threat on the peninsula. In a, ver in a very real sense, when you think about uh, the peninsula itself, it really is a hub for stability within Northeast Asia. So what, what happens there really has a, a, a very uh, serious or positive effect throughout the region. Uh, General Thurman is exactly right. Uh, the responsibility of the commander there is to keep the armistice, maintain peace and stability on the peninsula, and be prepared uh, with uh, our allies uh, to defend the Republic of Korea if necessary. I do not see, even though we perceive right now that there's a great charm initiative going on by Kim Jong-un, uh, I do not, not perceive that as anything differently that been, has been done in the past. We've seen it before. Uh, we hold out our hand and uh, uh, 
at one point they get what they want and they go back to business as usual. Uh, so I, I think it's a, it's a as uh, General Thurman said, I think you have to be calm when you ana analyze it. You have to look at it over a long period of time. You have to understand what's happening and you don't want anyone in Washington, D.C. to set their hair on fire so you're taking the wrong action <laughs> because miscalculation potentially is the gra gravest danger. Miscalculation is a, is a grave danger. I want to come back to that, but first let me ask um, about the stability of the North Korean regime. Uh, of, of course, Korea watchers often talk about collapse being a potential scenario for instability as much as aggression might be. Um, I open that up to whoever would like to go first. What are your thoughts on how stable um, the regime is and what the prospects are for a collapse scenario? Why don't you start since we already had a chance? Um, you know, I think that Kim Jong-un and what he just did in killing Chung sung Tech uh, is an example of concern in North Korea of Kim Jong-un has about how stable his regime could be, and it's proof that he will go to any means to be able to try to maintain that stability. Uh, I think more and more information is slowly, very slowly, starting to get into North Korea, and the North Korean people are very, very slowly starting to understand how their government now and in the past has robbed them of the human rights that they deserve or the freedoms that they deserve. And because of that, uh, the economy is in such bad, bad shape. So I think for if you look internally from a, a North Korean perspective, Kim Jong-un is understandably concerned where this is going in the future if his number one concern is how does his regime survive. And I think we have to be prepared for possible instability in the future. I, I would agree with Skip. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is I think uh, uh, Kim Jong-un will take whatever steps uh, necessary to keep the regime in power. Uh, secondarily, uh, uh, with uh, some of the events that have occurred uh, in purging uh, leadership within the, the uh, regime shows that uh, there is some inconsistency in uh, ideology, if you will, within the regime on directly where they should go, but I think he has it under control. Uh, I think he has it under uh, good control. I mean, it's easy to control folks with a gun to their head. Uh, in, my, in my mind's eye, uh, when you think of uh, the regime and you think about uh, some of the things that uh, have occurred, you know, I can remember when I, just before I took command and I, I got briefings from every smart person I could think of about North Korea. And uh, General Sharp was my executive officer uh, and everyone was predicting collapse within the, my tenure as sink in Korea. And at that point we developed a plan. Uh, here we are many years later and we're still talking about collapse. Uh, I, I think uh, even though the people have been deprived, there are prison camps all over the country. The economy has been on a downturn where you, you, you count it positive if it becomes a half a percent off the negative. Uh, you, look at, uh, you look at the military, you look at where the investment is going, it's going to nuclear and missiles and cyber and all of those things. Uh, I think we must focus on the main responsibilities, and that is to maintain peace and stability on the peninsula, maintain the armistice, and be prepared for any contingency that might occur. And whether that is a hostile provocation or whether that's instability in North, I think between the ROC and the U.S. alliance, we are strong enough to cope with any of those contingencies. Well, uh, I think uh, first off with the recent death of Chang Sun Tech, I was not surprised. I really wasn't uh, because he continues to purge leaders up there. He has replaced more of his commanders than both Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. 
And so when a person is doing that, that tells me that he's kind of worried about the folks around him and he wants to continue to further consolidate power. I do think you have to be ready for a collapse at some point. So you build contingencies in the military plans. That's what we do. And so you have to have good plans and you have to have good common sharing of intelligence and information. And you gotta protect that information. That is very important and it doesn't need to be debated out in the open public. Uh, but I think for the future, Again, it is very important, I believe, when dealing with, first off, I don't trust the North Koreans. After I, my time over, I don't trust what they say, and I worry when we're in a period of charm offensive. Because if you go back through history, that's when things can potentially occur. So I think, one, we gotta remain absolutely vigilant. And we got to question all the things we see every day, and that's why the day-to-day -day interface that you find in, on the peninsula with the military, with Combined Forces Command, is so important. Because that is, in itself, a strong deterrent, again, uh, is what I got out of this. But I think Kim Jong-un uh, will continue some of this uh, behavior. I think their road to uh, uh, eventual collapse is going to be the economic situation. I really do. I think if you know if you look at what's occurring over there today, we're spending a lot of resources on tourism, and while well, you got over 200,000 people in political prison camps, basically, and people starving to death. And then you've got also in this day and age, everybody has a cell phone, or they got some device. And I think access to the Western world at some point could be something that can cause a fracture uh, through social media and that sort of business. But I don't think we should ever underestimate the impact that that regime has had on its people for the, for the many years that we've been dealing with this problem. Because there's a human dimension to this thing. And I think when we start trying to predict that, we'll probably get it wrong. You know, just if I could oh, just please, add, yes. add on just very briefly is, you know, one of the things that Kim Jong-un and his, and his father did, and I think continue to do, is to try to convince the people of North Korea that they have an enemy, a very strong enemy in the Republic of Korea and in the, in the United States and that they have to be prepared for that enemy, and that's why the military first policy is absolutely needed and why their sacrifices are needed. We have seen in the past, and I believe we will see again in the future, a way that he reinforces that is to be able to do attacks, do provocations against South Korea, and then coalesce his military and his people that say, okay, look, they're struck back, we've gotta be prepared to, uh, to do anything that, uh, that we need to to defend North Korea. And you know, following along with what General Thurman said about the importance of the alliance and the combined nature of it, I think what we all worry very much about in that type of scenario, how do you control escalation so the thing does not spin out of control very, very quickly. And the way you do it is to make sure you're of one voice, of one mind, not just during the time of conflict, but all throughout your training, throughout armistice period in order to be able to do that. And that's why I'm confident, as General Tully says, we will be able to handle the situations in the future as they become more difficult. You just started to answer the next question I was gonna ask, so that was very well done. But let me first um, plug the Frontline piece that aired recently, which uh, featured Victor Cha and others on the state of North Korea. I, I commend anyone to watch that brief, I think it's just an hour piece. Um, on calculation and miscalculation, that is uh, clearly for any alliance um, a significant issue. For the U.S. ROC alliance, we've just gone through this period, certainly with the Chonan and the Waipido incidents, um, where you have a sovereign nation, the Republic of Korea, that feels it's been attacked. The U.S. is an ally um, through Combined Forces Command. We operate together. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit about how um, you walk through with an ally 
that dynamic to make sure that we're calculating together in a way that doesn't worsen a situation and in fact improves the situation. Any lessons learned um, either from those incidents that I just relayed or others um, that, that you had where you feel that the alliance was able to um, reassure the rock public um, and improve uh, the situation maybe by not escalating uh, uh, as, as Skip just relayed. Uh, maybe we start, J.D.? Yeah. Yes, uh, well, uh, one of the things that I inherited from General Sharp was the, uh, <laughs> was the uh, counter provocation plan. And in uh, March of, uh, of 13, we signed that. A lot of great work in that. And the whole purpose of that was a, an alliance mechanism to solve problems for the alliance to control de-escalation and respond to a, a provocation. And I think that is a great example of an alliance working together over some very tough issues and emotional issues. You know, when people get killed, people get emotional when blood's spilled. And... Uh, what, what is important about all of that, I think, is that I learned is, is the constant assessment of what is actually going on. And throughout the whole process, this is not denying anybody the right of self-defense. That's an inherent right. But in any type of military operation, what I've learned, before you take the first couple of steps, you better know where you're going to end up and kind of how you want this to end. And that was always at the forefront of, of what I was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, that one, you got to be ready. Two, you respond to protect people. And, uh, but if you're not careful, you can allow that to get out of control. So I think that's a good example of one of the things that uh, is good for the alliance, uh, again, it's a deterrent, uh, uh, deterrence against uh, the, uh, deters the North, but it also assures people that you've got two very, very close allies working together. And, uh, and I think that's important. Every situation is different, but you better take time to think through a situation before you react. If you do it, through pure emotion, you're going to get it wrong. That's what I've learned. And I learned that on the battlefield. John Tuella, thoughts on how to be reassuring as Well, I, I, th I think the reassure, reassurance is exactly as General Thurman described. We have an alliance. We have a strong alliance. We have a counter-provocation plan. Uh, we, we have uh, a modality or methodology through which when a provocation occurs, uh, together, uh, and again, going back to his first rule, rule of self-defense is always preeminent, but going back to the rule of, rule of provocation, that together uh, you're working to uh, solve the provocation issues and what action should be taken. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, I, I believe that uh, the statements uh, made by uh, President Lee and now President Park uh, have been a deterrent because the North Koreans know now that uh, the ROC, uh, our forces and the ROC government is not going to sit back and, and take uh, these terrible shots from uh, North Korea uh, without some sort of uh, uh, action to those provocations. So I think uh, JD has it exactly right. There's a plan. The plan has been worked together. Uh, there's a uh, command and control methodologies in place uh, to, to react to any provocation that might occur and not react uh, months later, but react quickly enough so it's tied to the provocation rather than tied to uh, some study of a provocation. No, I, I would agree with both. Um, I, I believe that Kim Jong-un is clearly understands that if he does another attack like he father did in 2000, uh, 2010, either the Chunin or the attack of Waipido, that the response coming back, not just from South Korea, but from the alliance. South Korea initially with self-defense and then the alliance is going to be very strong and very precise against North Korea. And I think 
strength and the willingness to use that strength is the strongest way you deter someone from acting. And I believe that the statements that have been made, the kind of provocation plan that was continued and actually signed is a clear signal to North Korea and Kim Jong-un, you better not do that again because things will not be like they were back in 2010. Um, I promise we're going to conclude my portion of this on broad regional issues, but I'm going to spend a little time here on the really nitty gritty um, defense to defense, military to military issues in the US um, ROC relationship. And I think those begin with um, issues surrounding ROC military modernization and OPCON transition. And um, General Sharp, you have actually written a piece on OPCON transition, which makes you the victim to, <laughs> to begin this conversation. Um, talk a little bit about how you think the ROC is doing in terms of maintaining or upgrading, modernizing its forces, and what implications that has for transitioning the operational control of forces. Um, I'll, I think the, what they have in this year's budget is a, is a very good indication that the Republic of Korea is committed to getting the capabilities they need in order to be able to, to defend the Republic of Korea with the U.S. As, as a strong alliance. If you look at ISR, if you look at PAC-3, uh, if you look at their continuing discussions about the next jet fighter, I, I, I think they are clearly demonstrating that it has to be followed through. This is not a one-year one year shot to be able to do that. But I think the indications of some of the capabilities that all three of us have talked about that they need uh, to develop and continue to develop, there's good indications that they're moving along those lines. Um, on OPCON transition, um, I, I guess I'd like to make three points on OPCON transition. Uh, first off, if you look at it from are the Republic of Korea military professional enough and ready to command and control in the war fight? In my view, they are absolutely. I do not question the professionalism and the capability of the leadership of the Republic of Korea to lead the war fight, uh, any type of war fight that, or instability that we would have. Uh, we have been with them for 60 years right now. We have all seen them in action, not just in exercises in Korea, but around the world, and I am absolutely confident in that leadership. That's point number one. Point number two is, uh, is, is I am, uh, really believe that we gotta look at what is the appropriate command and control relationship uh, from uh, maybe two different dimensions. Uh, first off is I do believe that a combined command center, a combined command structure should stay. I do not agree we should go supporting, supported relationship, it ought to be some sort of combined structure. And I think that needs to be thought of really in, in two dimensions. Um, first off is from armistice through conflict, so the whole dimension of both today and then what happens in the future. And then the second dimension is the dimension of provocations that are getting more and more dangerous, instability in an all-out warfight attack. So if you look at those six different blocks, if you will, what is the best command and control structure to put in place in order to be able to, to, be able to do what, what may be the most likely or the most dangerous scenarios we go through? And I think that is exactly what this group, the Republic of Korea and the U.S. group, led by the Minister of Defense and the Secretary of Defense, are taking a look at what are the conditions that need to be in place for the best time to do OPCON transition, and exactly what should that command and control structure take a look at. And then the last point, and I think General Tully will probably say even more about this, is we really do need to look at it from a regional perspective, not just a perspective on the Korean Peninsula, but what is best for security and stability in Northeast Asia with all the different things that are going on. So, so I'm confident that the study, the work that's going on now to determine where should this command and control relationship and how should it evolve over time will come up looking at all those different factors with the right answer because the Republic of Korea U.S. Alliance has been so strong and we are willing and able to sit down and talk to each other and, and say, okay, here's what we think across the board. You know, I guess the final point I'll make is this is like a marriage, but it's a good marriage. I mean, we're, we're not fighting like we want a divorce. 
We're trying to figure out how to strengthen, and both sides will have to agree on if there's going to be a change or not. Okay, JD. Well, first off, I agree with what General Sharp uh, has uh, talked about. Uh, one, uh, I spent a lot of time in this tough subject of OPCON transitions. Matter of fact, when I first got over, folks said, you know, be careful, you can't talk about that. But that's at the heart of the matter, command and control. In every operation I've been part of, it boils down to command and control. Joint, combined, command and control. Uh, first off, I, I agree completely on the professionalism of the rock, military and rock leadership. I have great confidence in them. And uh, that's first thing. But when you start bringing a lot of joint capabilities in to put together a joint command and control, you better have a fail-safe system of command and control. So I think that needs to be talked about. It needs to be conditions-based. One, you must stay in a combined arrangement. Supporting and supported doesn't work, in my mind, in, in an operation that could potentially occur on the peninsula because it could happen very fast. And you do not have time to start trying to go from armistice into crisis and start talking about how you're going to command and control. It won't work. Uh, I've been part of these operations where you go in and we throw together a C2 apparatus and borrow people and all that. Today, you have people that are training together every day for a common purpose. But I think as you go through and evaluate rock capabilities, joint capabilities, then that needs to be a determining factor. And the number one factor has to be the C4I architecture. Because that's how you rapidly bring joint capabilities together. Because anything that happens on the peninsula is going to end up being a joint type uh, uh, war fight if we get back into that situation. Uh, but I agree completely about the fact that you have to plan that from armistice through the whole spectrum of potential conflict in there. I think uh, as you look at capabilities, uh, and I would agree this year's defense budget has is, is got a good uh, mix of capabilities in there, and you have to follow through. You don't build that in one year. That, it takes time to do that. But I think you, over a period of time, uh, with the Alliance, is evaluating a constant evaluation of where uh, the ROC military is at in, in across its uh, whole joint uh, capability portfolio is something that needs to be looked at on a reoccurring basis. General Tawada. I, I would say uh, probably about four things, to, uh, and try not to be redundant, but I, I, I must be redundant on one thing. The ROC forces and leadership are well-trained, well-disciplined, well-led. That, that is a given. The second part is when we think about OPCON transfer, the Republic of Korea has come back to the United States of America and asked the United States government to delay OPCON transfer and make it condition-based. In my mind's eye, that has to be, we have to abide by what our rock allies desire. The study should not be a study on dates. And as some of you know in this room, I opposed OPCON transfer dates from the very beginning where it should be condition-based, but based on conditions. And conditions have to do with the threat. Conditions have to do with capability. Conditions have to do with the mission. And in my mind's eye, the glue that has held the defense, the stability, the relationships on the peninsula militarily have been the Combined Forces Command. So when you think about condition-based, I think you not only think about capability, you have to think about threat, you have to think about the organizational, it's the organization itself. And it's, some would say, well, it's a, an issue of who's in charge. When you're working towards a common goal, if the common goal is the same, it doesn't make any difference as to who's in charge. 
You know, and I don't know who said it, but someone said when, if it's not broke, don't fix it. CFC and the arrangements we have within the Combined Forces Command are not broken today. And I think that's the piece that with a very tenuous situation in the North, new leadership, nuclear capability, long-range missile capability, that the ROC President and Minister of National Defense saw that the best organizational construct at this particular time with these particular conditions are to keep the CFC and the OPCON transfer as condition-based. Now, should it be studied for the long term and when the conditions are right and defining what those conditions are, I agree. But in my view, we should agree with the request by the ROC administration to keep it as it is today until the conditions are, are correct. Okay, I'm going to let that stand for the, for the Q&A. I think there's some um, interesting differences there that, that we can um, draw on further if folks are interested. Um, General Tilley, let's talk a little bit about China. Um, as, again, as I said before, you really have the longest perspective on the peninsula and the role of at least the way I think the United States policymakers have come to see China's role vis-a-vis -vis the uh, peninsular debates um, has grown. There's a growing sense, if you will, that, that China has a major role to play here. Um, what are your thoughts on the North Korea-China relationship and China's potential role, positive or negative, in terms of a potential conflict on the peninsula? Well, uh, again, I, I don't think it's changed much, okay? I think that China's role in North Korea has been one of, uh, for lack of a better script, of providing those assets, resources, necessary to keep the regime in power. And that's been done over time. Now, it's almost like a family relationship that you have one of your family who is <laughs> dysfunctional. <laughs> They're still part of the family. North Korea is a dysfunctional activity. But the fact of the matter is, China is supporting them. They may not like the activities. They have taken steps to try to stifle uh, some of the activities, nuclear, for example, missile tests, for example. Uh, in some cases, they've probably been successful. In some cases, in most cases, they've not been. China could play a very critical role, I believe, in modifying the behavior of North Korea. Uh, to this point, uh, I don't think they've been very successful. At the same time, uh, do I believe that China would like a benign buffer state between China and, and the Republic of Korea? Yes. So the consequence is that I think they play a big role. I think they have played a role in uh, six-party talks. Uh, I think they have played a role in um, modifying the, the conversation uh, with North Korea. Uh, I do believe they could do more. And I believe uh, that the United States uh, and China uh, have to agree on what that more is you not only can talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk and do something about it. The, the other issue becomes, it's a very tenuous situation. When you turn the spigot on and off of resources, you have to also understand, as JD said, what are the consequences of that occurring? So China is in that role now. They have the spigot. They can turn it on, they can turn it off, they can modulate it, uh, but they must understand the consequences of everything they do. So I think China has a big role. Uh, I don't think they have uh, exerted the muscle that they have uh, to uh, modify the behavior of North Korea. 
General Thurman, thoughts on the role of China? No, I, uh, I would agree with uh, a lot of the comments that uh, General Talele just spoke of. I, I think uh, China is okay with us having a North Korean problem for the U.S. And I think oftentimes they, uh, I think they're quite satisfied that we're there. And I say that because we are a stabilizing factor. While at the same time, I think they view us as a threat into the overall region in there with our military. Uh, I think China plays a huge role, though, in trying to control behavior in North Korea. And I, I don't know if they're able to do that to the extent that, that we would like to see them uh, do that. I think it is important today to have good mill-to-mill -mill relations with the Chinese and to work close together. I think the economic side of the house drives a lot of things in uh, not only from the peninsula but for the whole region over there when you put all that together but uh, I think as we move to the future I think one of the key things that we need to be in particular uh, or observation of is the whole economic situation you know from the international currency uh, and the cost of doing business uh, in that region. I think it's just something that will eventually be a deciding point from an economic standpoint. Uh, but I do think uh, it's important uh, for the Chinese to keep a stable peninsula. And uh, Again, I think the wild card is what does North Korea do in the future? And I would like to see the Chinese be more involved in controlling North Korean behavior. Uh, I'll just add one thing that, uh, I mean, China, just like any other country, will do what's in their vital national interest. That's how they, as any other country, takes a look at it. Uh, and I think that China is starting to concern, be concerned about their vital national interest as a result of some of the North Korean activities. I'm convinced China does not want a nuclear North Korea. I'm convinced China does not want the chance of proliferation through their borders or an accident near their borders, a nuclear accident. Do I believe that they have taken enough steps in order to be able to prevent that and to be able to prevent escalation because of strong provocations? No, I believe they could do more. Uh, I think that we ought to be working very hard and trying to work hard with China, the Republic of Korea, Japan, and other parts of the region to determine what does a reunified peninsula look like and how is that in the vital national, how does that increase the vital national interest of all the countries that are involved? Because I believe that's the ultimate solution to this. One of the um consequences of more recent uh, um, North Korean provocations was uh, further U.S. deployments in direct response to that, which were then communicated to China as a reaction from the U.S. toward North Korea, but of course were deployments that the Chinese did not welcome into the region. And that brings me to the final piece I wanted to talk about before we open it up to the audience, and that's the rebalance. Um, I'd be interested in each of your perspectives on, the, to the extent that you think the U.S. is living up to the rebalance theme, how well you think the theme itself resonates um, in the region, and moving, if you will, even off pen, how you think about the U.S. as a stabilizing influence for issues such as in the ages um, dispute with the Chinese um, or Korea, US, uh, excuse me, Korea-Japan relations, um, what the rebalance may bring or what its limitations may be um, with regard to stabilizing the region. So let me start maybe with JB, if you don't mind. Well, I think for the whole rebalance issue, I think you got to look at not only military, but uh, all of the uh, diplomatic, informational, economic things that occur inside of, of rebalance. Uh, I think from a military point of view, and I'm going to speak for the peninsula, uh, I was asked to take a look at capabilities. Uh, 
uh, so we did a little capability review, and uh, so that's why it was clear to me we need to strengthen some of the ground capabilities, and we were able to modernize the U.S. Army forces on the ground. We were able uh, to uh, uh, strengthen missile defense, and these are all joint capabilities, and it, uh, the whole purpose was not to... Uh, you know, increased capabilities to cause a lot of anxiety. Uh, but if you look at what's been, what we've been able to do, we added uh, a, uh, helicopters. I asked for a helicopter squadron to be brought back in there because one, it's all about mobility on the peninsula and it's a mix of, of joint uh, capabilities that, that you got inside of CFC. It also gives us more experiences in that part of the region uh, but I think uh, some of the things we were able to do from the military side was nothing more than strengthening the capabilities inside the 28-5 number. And uh, I felt that was uh, needed over there. Uh, but I think as you go forward and you look at the, the region as a whole, I think a lot of times rebalance is looked at as a, as a threat uh, not only to the Chinese uh, being number one, but also with the North Koreans as they see what we're doing militarily. The greatest threat to rebalance, I believe, is the budget. Because when you reduce forces, you can't be everywhere. And I think that's one of the things that the Defense Department's got to deal with as uh, globally uh, as, as we look to the future. I tried to maintain a very close relationship with Admiral Sam Locklear, who's the PACOM commander. Uh, as we looked at across all of PACOM, all of the regional assets were, were available that we could use not only inside of PACOM, but also on the peninsula. But this is something that I think continues to develop. Uh, you can't do that overnight, uh, particularly when you're involved in, in uh, Afghanistan, and you're trying to uh, reduce the U.S. military. Now, I, I, I think rebalance, unfortunately, is not well understood, um, and sometimes used by people to point to the U.S. doing some things that they think that the U.S. shouldn't be doing. Because when you really look at rebalance, as J.D. said, it, it really is about much more than just military. It's about diplomatic with more ties diplomatically between the United States and countries within the Pacific, more diplomatic visits to make sure that we understand each other and are working towards the same goal, more free trade agreements to make sure that our economies are continuing to improve, and yes, militarily to make sure that we're prepared for any sort of instability or conflict within Asia. So uh, I think the rebalance when viewed from the perspective of what we're trying to do is to work in an area that's a vital national interest to the United States to maintain peace, security, prosperity and around the world, but especially in that region, uh, it is the proper thing to do. And I think you know, in many cases, we are putting, uh, putting our, our people, putting our money behind it in order to be able to help do that uh, throughout the region. I, I would agree with Skip. Uh, the fact is, is that the United States is a, a global power. We must look at the globe rather than one area. Uh, it does include all the elements of, 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 of national resources, as Skip and J.D. Uh, described. Uh, it, it, it includes engagement. It includes engagement with all the countries in the Pacific. Uh, we had a hard time just defining, uh, defining to people who would ask, what does that mean? So we went from focus to rebalance. So in that context, you can see there was a little bit of- And pivoting. <laughs> and pivoting. I mean, we've changed the, the, the dialogue and, and uh, the, the narrative. So rebalancing is probably the right word at this point. And what it includes is relationship building around, around the Pacific. It includes engagement engagement around the Pacific. It includes all of the elements, uh, as, as Skip and J.D. pointed out, diplomatic, informational, military, and economic, for all sorts of reasons. For example, I can, the, the United States Army Pacific uh, commander 
is conducting many engagement exercises in the Pacific right now, which have nothing to do with threat. It has to do with engaging and understanding and uh, cooperation. And that's the essence, I think. Uh, many people put the trappings of a military wrapper around this rebalancing, but it's not, that's not the wrapper. That's part of the means, if you will, as you think about en engagement in the region. So in that context, it, I think it's the right thing to do. At the same time, we must, uh, we must remain focused globally to ensure that around the world our vital interests are protected and maintained. Very good. Well, we have covered a lot of ground, and yet there are many topics we did not touch on. Um, so I'll be interested to hear the questions from the audience. We have microphones that will go around, so if you raise your hand and I call on you, um, give your name and your affiliation, and we'll give you a microphone. Oh, yeah, please, Victor. He has so, his own microphone. I have my own microphone. <laughs> Thank you. So, we, um, so this is being live webcast, and uh, it's also um, on a live Twitter feed. So we had some questions that came in from Twitter. <laughs> um, and so one yeah, of the, they're short. Twitter That's the good thing. Yeah, right. yeah. um, one of the questions is, um, uh, you have a lot of stars on the stage. I don't know if they mean movie stars or <laughs> m general stars. But, um, um, and the, qu the question is, um, for each of them, uh, what is your what was your biggest surprise uh, as a commander, and what is your fondest memory? Next question. Who wants to begin that? <laughs> well, the junior guy. <laughs> uh, junior guy. Uh, the biggest surprise I had was the volatility of the media. <laughs> I was not expecting what I found out. And I had been a guy that hadn't really done a lot of media engagements, but what was important, what was interesting, one morning I picked up the, one of the papers, the, uh, one of the sold papers, and it's got my picture on the front page and it says, General Thurman is bullying the media. Well, I hadn't even talked to anybody. <laughs> and I, so we run the traps and this guy uh, apparently wrote an article because he thought I was holding something back. But I suddenly realized is how perceptive people are. But that was probably the, uh, one of the surprises I had that I probably should have prepared myself a little bit better for. And I, of course, that was back in Washington. So I get a couple of calls. Hey, you know, if it's in the early bird, you're going to get a call about it nine times out of 10. But early bird doesn't exist anymore, I don't <laughs> think. Uh, but that was one of the things. And so, it did, it was instructive to me because it told me that we had to develop a good uh, outreach campaign uh, and to make sure one that we're in line obviously with the policies inside of, uh, of uh, not only in the Department of Defense but also here in Washington. My fondest memory uh, was the close relationship and the friends that, uh, that I established. Uh, one was with General Peck Sun Yup, uh, who is a true patriot, and also, uh, as I sat and observed the 60th anniversary uh, of the armistice. And I watched people who had gone before me and go up to Pan Munjan and look at the look on those Korean War veterans. That struck home to me. And it also told me the importance, once again, the alliance that was shared in blood and sacrifice. And so, I mean, that's probably the greatest uh, memory, best mill to mill partnership I ever had. So. Um, I think my biggest surprise came in how hard I had to continue to work to make sure that people in Washington and DC and in, in the United States understand the importance of this alliance and understand the importance of it in relation to peace and security in Northeast Asia and how strong 
this alliance can be in that, that real realm of peace and security. Um, as some of us have talked you know, about, you know, the, the U.S. during the time I was there was really primarily focused on the Middle East, what was going on in Iran and, and Afghanistan, um, in, in that part of the world. And to be able to say, look what's happening here, and if we want to maintain peace and security, the alliance, what is going on within Korea is important, uh, not just for the Korean Peninsula, but for the entire region. And, uh, and that, took, uh, that took a lot of work, not just by me, but by Kathy Stevens, by our other diplomatic folks that are there. And uh, I am convinced that we now completely realize that, and with the shift, the rebalance into the Pacific, that we are, as I said earlier, putting our money where our mouth is, that this is an important region to us. Uh, what was the best memory? Very much along the same lines as what J.D. said. It's the personal relationships and the personal friendships that for both General Talele and myself go back to 1996 and still have friends that we established. And I will speak for myself, but I'm sure it's the same for General Talele that we established in July of 1996 when we first got there. It's friends that we still go see on every visit that's over there. Um, but it's also not just the personal relationships and friendships, but it's the professional also. That you can really, you've established the trust and confidence between our two nations and our two militaries and our two diplomatic corps that you can really sit down face to face and, and talk out what are the issues and how are we going to resolve this as an alliance, as, a, as one. General Tlaib. I think the biggest uh, surprise uh, in, in my, my personal view was when you get a bit of intelligence information, the interpreta how the interpretation of that information can be <laughs> so different among two or three different people and two, or three, and two countries and the consequences of that. I, th I think that always was a, 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 an issue uh, that surprised me but was always resolved. The, the thing that uh, are my fondest memories, and uh, are no, not memories because they're truly act, activities right now, one is the Khmer Forces Command, which is a tremendous uh, headquarters, and the relationships in that headquarters, which is not just between the ROC, the Republic of Korea officers and non-commissioned officers, and the U.S. officers and non-commissioned officers, but with the families. Uh, the other piece of it, which is, is ver one of my fondest memories, is the graciousness of the Korean people overall. In my view, they're the most gracious people I've ever dealt with, individually and collectively. So just like Skip and uh, JD, when we go back, when I go back to Korea, I, I see friends that I've established over a long period of time. Uh, when they come here, we get together each and every time, and in the interim, we're communicating by email or other means. So it's, when you think about the ROC Alliance, what has the CFC bred, the Combined Forces Command bred? It has bred relationships which with, with, withstands frictions over time. You always come back to those relationships. That's the fondest memories that I have. I'd like to mention just one, one more thing, because I think it's, it's important to recognize the, what the Republic of Korea has done to honor our veterans that fought there 60 years ago. I know of no other country in the world that thanks veterans like the Republic of Korea does. I mean, just think about it. The thousands that the Republic of Korea have paid to come paid for to be able to come back to the Republic of Korea to see what their sacrifices has developed over those past 60 years. Again, uh, to, to all Koreans, I think we are all really thankful for you remember the past and you remember what the sacrifices of veterans in the United States, the Republic of Korea, and the UN nations from around the world did 60 years ago. And that's, that, is to be, uh, that is to be greatly congratulated. Very good. Okay, other questions? It's right over here.
Good morning, gentlemen, and it's uh, worked with the two of you, and it's great seeing you, General Thurman and General Sharp. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about China. Now, in the event of a crisis on the peninsula, uh, be it a conflict or instability, uh, that results in the U.S. and Iraq as an alliance intervening in North Korea, uh, you have the chance of the PRC intervening as well. So the U.S. and Iraq have uh, entered into North Korea. Uh, you have PRC intervening in its own interest. How do you keep the alliance from unraveling uh, in this situation because of differing perspectives on how PRC uh, intervention should be handled uh, so that you could accomplish the objectives that both sides want? Thank you. Uh, I'll give you, my, again, my personal opinion. Uh, I think the assumption that there would be intervention may, may not be correct. The way I would, first of all, I don't see the ROC and the U.S. alliance unraveling, number one. Secondly, I think providing information and discussion with China's leadership before any event which lays out the intent of the alliance before the event might mitigate any, uh, for, for lack of a better descriptive, uh, incursion uh, into whether it be instability or, or uh, a, a crisis. So uh, I, be I believe in coordination before the fact, discussion before the fact, and at least enunciating the intent of the alliance under different scenarios. So they do not perceive that it's, we're moving up to seize and hold territory. No, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I could say it any better. I, I agree that, that we need to be working now. We, the United States and the Republic of Korea, need to be working now with China to look through various different scenarios that could happen in North Korea and to make sure we've got a clear line of communications between the alliance and China to make sure that the intentions of where we're going, what the end states are going to be, are, are clearly understood, and, uh, and how the three countries, and I'll include Japan also, the four countries could work together uh, to resolve the situation uh, as quickly as possible. That, that's absolutely critical and, uh, to be able to, to do now. I would just add a couple of things to that. I think. Uh, where you run into a problem is when there is a surprise uh, which breeds mistrust. And I think that's why it's important today with uh, Pacific rebalance is more mill-to-mill -mill relations. So there's better understanding of true intentions. Uh, when you don't know the intentions of something, uh, then that breeds speculation and it causes uncertainty and it causes a lot of anxiety. So I, I would agree 100%. I think understanding what your end state is going to be uh, up front when you get involved in any military uh, use of military force has got to be paramount. And if you don't understand kind of if it's going to be reunification of the peninsula or whatever, if you don't understand where you're going with that, then that could cause a problem. But I think uh, I'm confident the Alliance can work through that just like these other two gentlemen are uh, and uh, will stay close. But it, it requires close coordination and exchange of information that can be protected. Good morning. This is Chang Min Sok from Asan Academy, uh, Republic of Korea. First of all, thank you for your sharing your thoughtful ideas. Um, recently, to strengthen U.S. Uh, RK joint military capability, uh, Kill Chain and I RAMD are under construction very uh, fast. Uh, however, what is worrying about is uh, inclining the level of threat uh, to say a uh, security dilemma, which might end up uh, into the arms race in the peninsula. Uh, I'd like to ask you, is there any prospect of Washington that North Korea would strengthen its military capability, uh, especially making, you, uh, making more nuclear bombs or 
chemical weapons after U.S. ROK's toughening joint military uh, capability? I didn't get the question. I didn't get your question. Did anybody understand right. well enough? No, okay, we, I think we, we had a hard time hearing, but you were asking if there was anything, go ahead, you can repeat, anything the North Koreans could do. Yeah, is there any prospect of Washington that nuclear would strengthen its military capability uh, after uh, U.S. ROK's toughening joint military uh, capability? US, strengthen U.S. nuclear capability, yeah. is my understanding. Yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Yes. So um, do you all see prospects for, I, let's broaden this out a little bit to a question on um, the U.S. nuclear deterrent overall for the Republic of Korea, the strength of that deterrent, anything that could call that into question if that generally gets to the issue, um, and um, what prospects you see for either the ROC's own um, proliferation or what the U.S. might do to strengthen that deterrent if necessary. Well, I think there's an agreement uh, between the Republic of Korea government and the United States government that uh, uh, the United States uh, uh, will protect the Republic of Korea. Uh, they are under our nuclear umbrella. Uh, so if that's the question, is there a need to strengthen that? I think the agreement is rock solid. I think there have been discussions between uh, various ministerials and also between uh, the, the presidents of the Republic of Korea and the United States. So I think it's a rock solid agreement right now. If you're asking me if, if the, the, the nuanced question is, should there be nuclear weapons placed on the, on the peninsula themselves, I would say absolutely not. Um, you know, I, I agree with what General Foley says, and I think that the alliance is, is moving forward in the, in the right direction to strengthen the alliance's capability to be able to deter uh, and defeat a nuclear type of threat. You know, if you look at what South Korea is buying as far as increased ISR, increased capability to strike into North Korea, um, uh, that is the right type of systems in order to be able to help deter the use of nuclear or any other type of, of weapon. So I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. I do think that, uh, that as we move forward, that, um, that increased intelligence sharing, uh, especially with Japan, is, is really critical. Uh, I've, I believe that there should be an intel sharing agreement between the Republic of Korea and Japan and the alliance because of the capabilities that that would bring in order to be able to help detect what's going on in North Korea. Um, I applaud what South Korea has done is looking at you know, buying more Pac-3, lower tier type of systems. I think in the future, South Korea needs to look at an upper tier system also. So again, I think we're moving in the right direction capability-wise. I agree completely with General Tawley says the nuclear umbrella is strong and, and steadfast and, and we are prepared. Uh, to be able to respond to a nuclear threat, and we do not need nuclear weapons on the peninsula to make that happen. Uh, I would say uh, the same thing. Our, our policy of extend, uh, extended deterrence, I believe, is the right policy. Uh, and one, there does not need to be any reentry of nuclear weapons on the peninsula. You're talking about a global and regional issue here that needs to really be looked at. And I think. The policies are right in regard to that. Uh, I, too, uh, think that uh, the uh, ROC government's making the right investments in their uh, lower-tier missile defense. I remain concerned about the growing population. When you look at Seoul and how close it is to the demilitarized zone, your greatest threats is long-range artillery and missiles. You know, the other thing that's something we should be mindful of is a uh, nuclear uh, uh, disaster of some sort that Absolutely. could occur uh, at one of their test facilities up there. That is probably one of the greater threats that we got to be prepared to deal with because it's not only going to affect the peninsula, it's going to affect the Chinese, the Russians, and the Japanese, and it's going to excite a lot of people. And so that's something I think is a vulnerability that we need to be paying attention to for the future. And the other vulnerability along those lines is proliferation. I mean, the, Kim Jong-un is not stupid, and, uh, and I'm sure that if he could sell something to terrorist organizations, 
to get some hard cash, he, he would do that. And being able to watch to make sure that proliferation is, is not happening is, is absolutely critical. Um, J.D., I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit since you uh, most recently left. And, of course, um, there has been talk in South Korea, though it's my understanding not in serious government circles, about um, South Korean nuclear capability. What's your sense of what that would do to the regional dynamic if the South Koreans were to pursue their own nuclear capability? Well, one, I think it would uh, potentially tip the the scale on the, on the balance of, uh, of deterrence and the true uh, intention. I think that would excite uh, a lot of folks over there. And again, I was asked several times about that. And I think through the policy of extended deterrence, there is sufficient capability. And you know, we talk about nuclear war and all that. Folks need to really examine what that really means uh, and the threat of that. Uh, so uh, again, I think as long as you got the right mix of capabilities, that should be sufficient uh, uh, deterrence. I think our greatest threat would be if the regime is threatened up there to the sense that they're going to lose it all, then that is something we better be very mindful of, of what the young leader may or may not do in the protection of that nuclear capability. It's something we need to pay attention to uh, every day and make sure that we remain absolutely vigilant. But you should not put nuclear weapons back on the peninsula. There's no reason for it. Let's say, how about all the way in the back over here? Uh, Gilbert Rosman, the, the Asan Forum. Uh, General Sharp has brought our attention to Japan on a couple of occasions, and I'm wondering if each of you could comment on what you've tried to do to improve the coordination with Japan uh, uh, and so that we have more tri trilateral activity and how you've been disappointed by things that haven't worked. Uh, I'll start. I mean, you know, obviously, as the commander over there, looked at it from a military perspective, and, and I think we would all agree that if you if you have an alliance, that uh, if you if you have coordination and intelligence sharing between not just the Republic of Korea and the United States, but also Japan, that that's that that would greatly enhance the deterrence in the actual fighting capability. So specifically. We tried to work through intel sharing agreements. Uh, that did not work. Uh, we tried to work through having more uh, combined exercises with the Republic of Korea and the United States, mainly around search and rescue, humanitarian assistance types of things, uh, in order to be able to establish the coordinating mechanisms between the militaries. Um, I, I think uh, that that needs to continue. We need to, to try to find ways to be able to work together I understand the issues that are out there on the, the side of what uh, President Abe and, and, and others have done in the recent past and, 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 uh, and, and not taken responsibility for what that country did many years ago. And I understand those concerns. Uh, but I, I, I hope that we're able to continue, that, not continue, I hope we're able to, to work with Japan in order to be able to come up with mechanisms that if we had to go to war, uh, because I am confident if we had to go to war, Japan would be there on this side of the alliance. I'm, I am confident of that. But I'd rather work through the details of how all that's going to work now in armistice rather than waiting till after the bullets start flying. I, I agree with General Sharp. You have to work it beforehand. Uh, you can't have a hockery during a time of crisis. Uh, two of the critical capabilities that I think would would not only strengthen the alliance, strengthen the region, and be very, uh, if you will, positive from the standpoint of moving ahead is one, the intelligence sharing agreement, and secondly, an integrated missile defense system uh, where both parties are threatened very seriously, both countries. So in my view, I think to continue to pursue these things, I think is very, very important for both the Republic of Korea and the United States and Japan? Well, uh, 
I would agree with, uh, with both uh, General Sharp and General Talele. I think, first off, it is important, particularly in the East Sea area, to do more trilateral military operations. One, that allows you to get a better common understanding. Now, I spent a lot of time on missile defense over there, just like both of these gentlemen, I'm sure. And the most important thing with missile defense to make sure assets, joint assets, whether it be Aegis ships uh, or your ground-based missiles or your airborne platforms are in the right place, you have to share information. You have to have connectivity. And that's important not only for the peninsula, but it's also important for the region. The Musadon missile is an example. That has a 3,500 kilometer range on it. Okay, that's a good distance. Everybody's in that threat. So it would be nice to be able to share uh, those type of, uh, of data links and information. And I think that's important. I watched us come together several times whether it be a nuclear test or two missile launches, and we were able to talk to each other. Not only with uh, inside the ROC US, but also with, uh, with Japan. And I think that's something for the future that we really need to strengthen. And I know there are some deep-rooted historical problems, but what I was confident of in our military operations, particularly in Combined Forces Command, and the fact of the matter is there are seven UN sending state bases that are in the Republic of Korea that would be necessary Japan, should there be, in, Japan. In, in I'm sorry, in Japan, if there was a, uh, some type of, uh, of situation where you had to rapidly uh, reinforce the peninsula, that's there. I'm confident that that's going to be available. But I think I... That's one of the things in the future that I think we got to keep chipping away at and try to get past the old historical problems that are out there. And I know they're deep rooted. Okay, right up here. Uh, Song Cho Rhee with SBS, Seoul Broadcasting System from Korea. Uh, I understand that General Scott Parody uh, indicated that he wants some troops. Uh, stationed uh, in the region north of Han River uh, as a strong indication of deterrence. Uh, do, do you, do you uh, agree with that view, or do you think that the relocation plan should go on as scheduled and, and as agreed upon between the two countries? Well, I'll take that on. I, I, I can take that on. I know a little bit about that. Uh, when I looked at the relocation, Again, I think that's, it's all conditions based. Uh, and I think we gotta be careful of setting a date on the calendar and says everybody's repositioned at this time because you have to look at the threat. The fact of the matter, one of the most significant threats outside of missiles is the long range artillery that the North Koreans have. That's 240 millimeters and 170 guns in the close proximity. So examining the capabilities from a combined perspective, joint and combined, I think is important. And uh, there is a timeline to move all that, so maybe uh, you have to look at when you move that capability uh, and make sure that, one, you can protect the peninsula. So one thing that got my attention up front when I read the terms of reference, the commander of Combined Forces Command is held accountable for the defense and protection of the Korean people, the rocks. So you gotta kinda look hard at that. But again, I think it's a review, conditions-based, uh, and examine that with the Rock Minister of Defense uh, along with our uh, Department of Defense and make sure that we've got the uh, threat covered and we've got the right mix of capabilities. And that's a constant assessment. You, as a commander, you have to do a running estimate every day. So you understand the threats around you and make sure you're living up to your end of the bargain of if something goes wrong. So I think that's what this is all about and having the right readiness, readiness 
that is expected for the joint and combined uh, forces that are operating on the peninsula. Okay, let's do one last question, please. Right over here. Um, Olivia Enos from the Heritage Foundation. My question is, um, in the event of a regime collapse in North Korea, what role do you see the, the U.S. military playing in providing humanitarian assistance to ensure that there's not a greater human rights crisis um, on the peninsula? Well, uh, I'll jump on this and then uh, uh, pass off here. But I think we always have a uh, responsibility for humanitarian assistance, always. And in, in, in our planning efforts, we always plan for that. Uh, now, if there is a collapse over, I would like to see the rocks in the lead because these are Korean people taking care of Korean people. And, you know, where we come into play is, again, making sure we got the balance right with the military capabilities. Uh, but there's planning that goes on all the time with that. If there's a humanitarian crisis and a collapse, you know, getting a common understanding of how bad the situation is is really going to be important. Uh, and what do you need? Whether it be medical capability or uh, food or, you know, it's a whole wide range. But that's something I think we always need to be prepared for uh, because we already know there, is, there are problems up there when it comes to uh, nutrition and medical and the threat of other diseases and that sort of business. No, I, I would agree. I think we have learned in Iraq and Afghanistan that humanitarian assistance has to start from day one when the bullets start in order to be able to make sure that the people the common people are best protected and taken care of as possible. And in a situation like North Korea, it's probably even, my view is it's even more important because of the indoctrination that the North Korea people have gotten since they were born of how the South and the United States are complete enemies and all they care about is killing you. Uh, if we don't have plans, which I know we do, plans that along with going to destroy the North Korean military or get them in check at the same time we're trying to help the people and get the right information as to what our goals are in North Korea, are the ROC US alliance goals in North Korea, uh, then the, it will be much more difficult to regain stability up there. So uh, I believe that, uh, that we have learned that. We have forces that can help with that. Uh, uh, being able to get supplies and be able to get information in North Korea. Uh, and it's a critical part of the plan that I agree with J.D. should be led by the Republic of Korea. Last word to you, General Tuelli. Certainly, uh, General Sharp and General Thurman are closer to uh, the existent plan, but I am very confident that every contingency, starting with humanitarian support through crisis, has been planned for in ultimate detail by the Republic of Korea and the United States in the Combined Force Command. So I'm very confident that any contingency that might arise has been thought through in a lot of detail and who does what to whom has also been thought through. So is that part of uh, any, any uh, plan? Of course it is. How it is executed uh, I think has been planned for. Very good. Well, that concludes our morning session. I'm going to turn it back over to Victor to kind of move us along. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, again, a, I thought a wonderful discussion. Um, uh, the, the social, I don't know if any of you generals are on social media, but the social media universe was exploding. There were lots of questions. You'll be happy to know that USFK was also on and retweeting any of the things that you were saying. <laughs> Those are the tough questions, right, Judy? <laughs> getting a thousand critiques. Right. <laughs> um, um, uh, so uh, a couple of things. The first thing is that, um, so we will now uh, take a break. Uh, lunch is served for those of you uh, out on the concourse level uh, for our guests. If you'd just be seated, lunch will be brought to you. Um, we will be having um, uh, Dr. Sid Seiler from the White House joining us for lunch. Uh, Sid has arrived despite the blizzard. 
Uh, and then the last thing, of course, is I want uh, all of us to thank um, these uh, four individuals on the stage, not just for this morning's uh, event, but for their service, uh, both uh, to the United States, uh, to the Alliance, uh, truly a, a, real, um, um, a real tribute to, to you guys for all that you've done. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.